Well, good morning. It is Monday morning, August the 10th, 2020. And this is our morning devotion, Growing Closer, as we seek to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, I hope you were able to worship yesterday, either in person or via a live stream, computer, YouTube, something like that. But I hope you really worshiped. I'm afraid that a lot of people are getting out of the habit of, uh, of worshiping. When they worship at home, they have a tendency not to sing, not to interact, not to have their Bibles out and follow along and take notes. I hope you are uh, participating wherever you may find yourself. I started to take time this morning to talk about different elements of worship and what worship is. But as I was preparing, I was drawn to take a, a look at John's record of the gospel, the Apostle John. So if you have your Bibles, uh, for a little bit, let's take our Bibles and look at John's record of the gospel. It is, it's generally assumed that the gospel of John is easy to understand. Often you hear that cliche that the gospel of John is the simple gospel. And the simplicity of the language has deceived a lot of people because it was written on approximately a sixth grade level of what we would know as sixth grade today. Uh, it's written in monosyllabic and disyllabic words, which means one and two syllable words. And I want to just give you a couple of verses to illustrate what we mean by that. If we go to John's record of the gospel and look, for instance, down at verses 11 and 12, um, says he came to his own and his own received him not but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name now we have no problem there with the words themselves they are all either one or two syllables in length but actually here you find some of the most profound theology of anywhere in all of the gospel records uh, that means out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you don't find any deeper thought than you find in these simple words. Uh, there sometimes arises that question as to why we have four Gospels. And uh, perhaps one of the early church fathers by the name of Origen put it best when he said, we do not indeed have four Gospels. We have a fourfold Gospel. Really what it is is that we have four different individuals who look at that beautiful diamond of the gospel from a different facet. People ask, well, do the gospels differ? Well, yes, they differ. Uh, do they contradict? No, they don't contradict. They are four different viewpoints of Christ, and each has its distinctness about it. For example, when you look at Matthew, Jesus is presented as the promised king and Messiah of Israel. And consequently, Matthew's message to Israel is Behold your king. It's all about uh, the, uh, the, the Messiah and the Jewish king. Mark, on the other hand, does not represent Christ as king, but as a servant prophet. And one of the reasons there's no genealogy in Mark is because no servant had a genealogy that mattered. And so the message of Mark is, Behold your servant. Now, people look and say, Well, we know Matthew and, and Luke and John, but who is Mark? And uh, why is he considered one of the gospel records? Most people believe that Mark wrote what Peter gave him. He was one of Peter's cohorts there, if you will. Then we come to Luke, and Luke presents Christ as the perfect man. He's walking among the people of the world, so Luke's message is behold the man. So Matthew wants us to behold the king. Mark wants us to behold the servant. Luke wants us to behold the man. That's the humanity of Christ. But John takes us to a totally different dimension. And uh, the gospel begins with a divine genealogy of Christ. I want to tell you quickly that when somebody asks me, well, I've never read the Bible, where do I start? I always encourage them to begin with John's record of the gospel. Some of you may remember that we had a couple of uh, Islamic folks that uh, became a part of our fellowship. We got to baptize one of them. And when they came to faith in Jesus Christ, the very first thing we did is we began to study John's record of the gospel with chapter 1 and verse 1. 
John wrote for a specific purpose of presenting Christ, and he gave his own words the reason that he wrote the book. And if you have your Bible, just flip over to chapter 20. I want you to see in chapter 20 of John, verses uh, 30 and 31, John chapter 20, 30 and 31, I want you to see what John gave as his reason for writing the gospel, his purpose. He says, and truly Jesus did also perform or did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, uh, which are not written in this book. But these have been written, and here's the reason he wrote the book, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And here's the second reason, that believing you may have life in his name. So you find it very interesting that he gives his reason for writing the book way over at the end of the book in chapter 20 and verse 30. Now, as you study John, it's interesting that the word miracle is not a dominant word. John does not speak of miracles. He speaks of signs. And uh, the, the signs uh, are indications that Jesus Christ is God, is Messiah, is the Son of God. There are three words that are used consistently in the New Testament for miraculous or supernatural events of God. There's the word power, and there's the word wonder, and there's the word signs. Power has reference to the operations that produce results. Wonder has a result, is, is reference to the results of the power and its purpose. And signs have something to do with the purpose God has in making the wonder or working the wonder. And so you'll find that those words are the same words that Paul used in 2 Thessalonians 2 when he was talking about the Antichrist coming and with all kinds of powers and wonders and signs that would demonstrate his devious purposes and the false signs and wonders. <clears throat> Pardon me. So power refers to the supernatural power of God. Wonder results of that power working and signs God the purpose that God has in them. So it, John says, Jesus did many other signs, many other signs in the presence of his disciples not written in this book. So John's method of writing to us has to do with signs and with selection and with significance. And John is saying that he selected just some of those signs that they might significantly present his purpose, and his purpose is twofold. He makes it very clear. He's writing that people may believe, and then secondly, he's writing that they might have life. So the first purpose is intellectual conviction. And you know, there has to be the cognitive, there has to be an understanding, but we want to see the intellectual or the cognitive move to a volitional or a willful application of the understanding that comes. And so the second purpose is to move beyond the intellectual conviction to a volitional commitment so that men might not only understand who Jesus is, but that they will make a volitional commitment of their wills to Christ, to Jesus, to be saved. So we have that statement by the writer himself as to what his purpose is. John says, I have selected these particular signs that in their significance they might lead you to intellectually accept the facts about Jesus Christ and volitionally commit your heart and your life to him. And so that's, that's the purpose. Now we back up, we get to the very first of the gospel, and we find the prologue. We find the first part of the book, the introduction, if you will. The prologue is the first 18 verses. And those verses contain the concepts of eternity, the incarnation, and salvation. So as you look at those 18 verses in the entirety, you could say that they contain uh, the entire gospel. They, in uh, they contain salvation in a nutshell, if you will. In the first five verses, you see the pre-existent Christ, the pre-existent Word of God. As a matter of fact, look at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
Now that differs from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are known as the synoptic. That word synoptic means to see alike. And it takes us back, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke take us back to Bethlehem. But John takes us back before Bethlehem, back beyond the beginning, all the way into eternity, and establishes for us that Jesus is eternal that he existed long before he was born. That cannot be said about any of us. It can only be said about Jesus Christ. It says, in the beginning. Now, that sounds very familiar, doesn't it? In the beginning. That's because those are the same three words that you find in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. And here we are told, in the beginning, all things came into being by him, talking about Jesus Christ. And so we find the idea here. John uses Greek words, but he had a Hebrew mind. And John is revealing to us and showing us how Jesus is showing us who God is and what God is like. And what a word. You know, one of my favorite books that we have, that there is out there is a book by A.W. Tozer called The Knowledge of the Holy. And it's talking about what God is like. But if you want to get the best picture of what God is like, you look at Jesus. And John used these Greek words, but he had a Hebrew mind. Now, what is a word? A word is a medium of manifestation. A word does not have meaning. It has usage. It represents what is real. For example, one word can have many different usages. Uh, Down in uh, the South where I grew up, we used to talk about uh, somebody would say, uh, uh, pass me a plug. Now, what does that mean? It well it depends on who you're with because if if you're uh, in a house, a plug could be where you plug in an electrical uh, uh, unit of some kind, a clock or some kind of appliance or something that needs electricity. If you're out in a boat and you're fishing, a plug could be a fishing lure. Or if you're with some guys chewing on some tobacco, cutting off a plug of tobacco would be a a hunk of tobacco. And all three of them use the same word, but they all have different meanings. And so when you come to the Bible, you want to understand that the words represent the reality. And so when when we have that Jesus is the Word, Jesus is showing us the invisible God. Christ made visible the invisible God. A word is a means of communication. I transmit my thoughts by my words. Uh, Somebody said, well, how do you separate thoughts from words? You can't. I challenge you to try to have a thought without having words. Christ is God manifested to us. He is God's word to us. A person's word not only indicates his thoughts, they not only indicate his intellectual accomplishment, but they indicate his moral moral character, who he is, his attributes. So a word goes much, much deeper. Jesus not only showed us God. He communicated God to us. He revealed God to us. We could stay forever on each of these words that were there, that are here. For for instance, in the beginning, uh, the beginning of what? The beginning of time. God, Christ, the Holy Spirit had no beginning. They are outside of time. They're before time. They're after time. They're in time. They're under time. They're all over. And so you have a beginning. The beginning is the timeline. Then that word was an interesting word. It's in the imperfect tense, which means it is a continuous state. Then you have the plurality of the Godhead that is here. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. You have a plural subject with a singular verb. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The whole idea of God here, Elohim, is the... Hebrew plural of the word God. And so you have uh, so much that are that's tied up just here in these short little verses. And then you have the preposition, pros, was with God. What does it mean was with God? Uh, what does it mean that when it says all things were made by him? And that great statement that is made in Colossians, All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. So when we begin to look at John's record of the gospel, 
while he may use very simple words that even a child can read, and even a child can know the meaning of the words, the thought or the thought that is there is very, very, very deep. I noticed that I'm out of time for this morning, and so we'll pick up here a little bit tomorrow morning and look again at these first uh, two or three verses and see what it has to say to us as we think about the gospel record according to John. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for the time we have in your word that we can begin a new work week in your Bible. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to apply it, uh, that we would understand that uh, you are the uncaused cause, that you are from the beginning. And Lord, that you existed, that all things were made by you, and without you was not anything made that was made. And Father, while we find these words are simple, we know that the thought behind them are, is very deep. And unless your Holy Spirit is our teacher and makes application of these things, we cannot understand them. So I pray that your Holy Spirit would take these words and apply it individually to every person who hears that they may know the truth that you want to communicate to us all. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So glad that you joined with us this morning. Let me tell you what I need you to do. I really need you to, to uh, communicate with me, to either private message me or email me, and tell me some things that are on your heart and mind. I want to bring you biblical answers to questions that you're living with on a daily basis. I don't like for the devotions to simply be an intellectual exercise. As we were talking about in the devotion this morning, there has to be some cognitive recognition, but there needs to be a volitional or a willful application. So if there are things that you have there that you would like me to look at from a biblical standpoint, please get me those questions and things because I want our devotion time to be a time that it's uh, for all of our growth in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's good to see we had uh, at the uh, biggest point this morning, I think a little over 20 that were operating. Let me ask you, for some reason, our numbers fell off by 25, 26% last week, not only in the number of people who were watching and the view uh, views, but in the engagements and the reach. Uh, when people don't watch and when you don't comment, when you don't like and do those thumbs up and hearts and things, uh, it doesn't reach nearly as many people. We were reaching right at 4,000 people, and then last week we dropped down to about 28, 2,900 uh, people on the week. And so the more that you will comment and the more that you hit those thumbs up and hearts, the further out it gets our uh, devotions every morning. So please take time to do that. Uh, these may be helpful for some people somewhere. I hope so. The promise of God's Word is it doesn't return void. Good morning, Dorothy and Nelson. Thank you for watching your faithfulness. Cheryl, good morning. Good to see you. And Rick, this is my favorite gospel book as well. You know, every time I study a book, I say, this is my favorite book. I look at Paul's letters to the churches, and Romans is so great because it has the gospel and doctrine, but I love uh, the book of uh, Philippians and how it applies there. Then First, Second, and Third John and James, it, I just love all of it it's so much. Rachel, it's good to see you. Did I see you yesterday, Rachel? I don't think I did. I think I missed you yesterday morning. You, I usually see you every week. Good morning, Richard. Thank you for that uh, uh, private message that you sent me yesterday. I enjoyed that, and I have a tendency to, I have enough conspiracy theorists in me at times to think some of that may be so. Um, good morning, sweet wife. Good to see you are listening this morning. Archie and Frida. Uh, good to see you. Tell Archie, if you're listening, we will have breakfast in the morning at 8 o'clock, and we'll talk and uh, see you then at harvest in the morning at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Good morning, Robin. Good to see you on here with us. Thank you for being so faithful and watching and being a part. Good morning, Tanya. Glad that you're with us. Hope you're feeling better. And I did not read your message until early this morning. And uh, so you're shaking your head yes and no. I appreciate that. You're very sweet. Uh, I love the church at St. Anne, and I love to go in there and have that time 
uh, got the greatest compliment is one time we were in there singing and the priest came up to me after and said, would you stay and sing for this next group? <laughs> Nobody has ever asked me to sing. As a matter of fact, when my uh, oldest daughter was just a young one, she would put her hand over my mouth and say, don't sing, Daddy, don't sing. Good morning, Dan and Dixie. We appreciate your faithfulness and being here every morning. Good morning, Brian and Betty. Uh, Betty, I hope you enjoyed those tomatoes. They are getting very, very thin. I went out yesterday, and there were only two on the vines. It looks like they're about over for us. Good morning, Diane. Good to see you back in the school routine. Good morning, Carol. Glad that you have joined with us this morning. Tell Bill good morning for us. Uh, feed him a couple of scrambled eggs and uh, uh, wants that biscuit real brown. Uh, good morning, Cheryl, again. You don't sing anyway. Well, we all need to sing. We all need to sing. When we get to heaven, we'll have that perfect uh, voice, I know, but uh, you play that uh, flute, don't you? And so you're, you're, you're making a joyful noise with your musical instruments there. Good morning, Star. Lori, I have missed you. I hope you're doing better. Uh, good to see you on here. Good morning, Terry. If you're not working this week, hope to see you tomorrow morning. Good morning, Lisa. Glad that you're with us. We've been thinking about you. Hope things are doing a little better. Glad that Brian got home yesterday. Good morning, Dawn. Good to see you on us. Good to see your family. Boy, I, I so enjoy Caitlin and I appreciate her so much and her singing. And good morning, Judy. Hope you're feeling better and are doing better there, that uh, you're able to get those medical issues under control. Good morning, Miss Patsy. Uh, glad to see you on here. And Teresa's listening. Good morning, Grams. Always good to have Grams. Valerie, glad that you were able to be with us this morning as well. Look, we appreciate all of you. Remember, you're in our hearts, you're on our minds, and every time your name comes to our mind, we say a quick prayer for you. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit brings people's names to our minds for a reason. And when you think of someone, the best thing in the world you can do for them is to say a prayer. Remember what we're told over in the Old Testament in Samuel, God forbid that I should sin against God by ceasing to pray for you. We want to pray for you. I hope that you'll be praying for us. Uh, this COVID stuff, no telling where it's going. This is a wild and crazy world. And people are responding in ways that I never would have dreamed. Listen. listen. Uh, how you act and how you react. You cannot control what happens to you, but you can control in the power of the Holy Spirit how you respond to it. Be sure that your response is such that it glorifies God and that he gets all the honor and the praise. So thank you so much for that. Remember, we love you. Y'all have a wonderful day. Beautiful sunshine. going to be hot and sweaty outside today if you need to get work done. God bless.